Okay. Good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to the, uh, the final presentation of the 2016 uh, Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series, uh, which is sponsored by the Royal Tyrrell Museum Cooperating Society. Uh, today we're glad to have with us Jeff Zimmer, and he's the uh, District Fish and Wildlife Officer for the Drumheller area. Uh, Jeff's duties primarily consist of compliance and enforcement, but he also deals with problem wildlife issues uh, that involve large carnivores and large ungulates. His past experience includes working in the Pincher Creek District uh, for a few years where he gained a great deal of experience with capturing and immobili immobilizing grizzly bears before relocating them. There he also frequently dealt with problem black bears, cougars, and wolves. Previous to coming to Drumheller, and I understand he's been here for about a year now, he was posted in the Medicine Hat District where he dealt a lot with cougar issues that involved trapping uh, problem cougars and also doing public education sessions. Um, as most of you are probably aware, the recent sighting of a cougar near the Royal Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology this spring resulted in a lot of conversation in Drumheller about these misunderstood creatures. So in his presentation today, Jeff will provide us with a better understanding of cougar behavior and hopefully uh, to be less fearful of them. Merely seeing a cougar does not mean you are in imminent danger. In fact, cougars are generally very shy and wary of humans, but they are very efficient hunters. They most often hunt at dawn or dusk, but they can be active at any time of day or night. So Jeff will present information on basic identification characteristics of cougars, their habits and habitat, and we'll discuss how to prevent conflict and respond to an encounter. Um, he tells me he will also provide us with some local data related to cougar sightings and issues. So it should be a really interesting presentation. It's entitled Cougar Awareness Pre Preventing Conflict. So would you please join me in welcoming Jeff Zimmer. Thanks, Earl. Thank you. Um, so this presentation is uh, it's a province-wide presentation, and uh, most of our officers that uh, provide it, they, they give a little bit of a twist to it where they add some uh, local data. And uh, towards the end of the presentation, uh, that's where you'll find the local data. There's a whole two slides with that. Um, and uh, I'll discuss that more when we get there. Uh, so like Earl said, uh, I'll talk to you about basic identification, uh, what to look for uh, when you're in cougar country just to keep yourself safe, and, uh, and then what to do if you have an encounter. Uh, me personally, uh, I grew up in northern Saskatchewan. Uh, I'd never ever seen a cougar in the wild. In fact, uh, where I grew up uh, was on the east central part of the province, close to an area called the Wildcat Hills. And it was always rumored there were cougars in there. Uh, I, I never went to that area, nor did I ever hear of anyone saying that they had seen cougars out there. Uh, until recently, and now I know that uh, people actually go out there and hunt cougars. So the, the population has, has expanded out there. Uh, when I was uh, a conservation officer in Saskatchewan, I spent a year and a half in the Cypress Hills on the Saskatchewan side, uh, doing lots of horseback patrols, uh, backcountry patrols in the West Block, which is the block that's attached to the Alberta side. And uh, my boss there, the, the park uh, superintendent, always talked about uh, cougars, cougar, seeing cougar tracks, uh, finding cougar dens. Again, in all my time there, I never ever came across a cougar or any cougar sign. Um, and then, uh, and more recently, I guess, they've had uh, more confirmed sightings. In fact, uh, the University of Alberta has had a few of their students go out there and trap cougars and uh, put radio collars on them and, and track their movements. Uh, for a while, they talked about uh, uh, the Cypress Hills having the largest density of cougars in North America. And uh, right away, all the local people, Medicine Hat, thought there must be thousands of cougars out there if they have the highest density. And then to add insult to injury, when uh, Canadian Geographic did an article on cougars, uh, they misprinted how many cougars the scientists figured were there. 
So they misquoted and said 300 to 400 cougars, or sorry, 200 to 400 cougars, when really it was 20 to 40 cougars. <laughs> so, I mean, that's why there was this big hype in Medicine Hat, and of course, that all came on our shoulders, because what are we doing about it? Uh, people were afraid. I had people would say to me, well, I'm never camping in Cypress Hills again, because the cougars are going to eat me and my kids. And my thought process was, well, how does Kananaska stay in business? Because they, not only do they have cougars, but they've got bears, two kinds, grizzly bears and black bears, but yet they get hundreds of thousands of visitors every year. So it was just, it was just a big hype. Um, I tried to turn that around, and I hope I did in a way with this presentation. Uh, because, I mean, most of the time people are fearful because they don't understand. And uh, with this presentation, I've had people come up to me afterwards and say, oh, I didn't realize that, you know, it wasn't, the cougars are something that, you know, I didn't have to fear, that, you know, I have a better understanding, therefore I'm going to feel more comfortable when I'm out in cougar country. Okay, so this, we'll get the talk going here. So I like this slide, cougars always watching, waiting for you to let your guard down. Definitely not true. So some f physical characteristics about cougars. Uh, the average weight of an adult male is 140 to 180 pounds. Okay, I've had people call our office and say, I have pictures of a cougar i seen along the river valley. And when I've looked at those pictures, uh, it's a tabby cat, an orange tabby cat. And I mean, how, how much does an orange household tabby cat weigh? Five pounds, maybe? Okay. But, I mean, in fairness to the people that see cougars or suspected cougars in the wild, they usually have nothing to reference size to. They're looking through binoculars or they've got their camera zoomed right in. So, I mean, you zoom a house cat in on that screen, that little tiny screen, it can look like it's 200 pounds, okay? Um, we have had cats taken in the province. Uh, that have been over 200 pounds. There was one by Edson here a few years ago that was, uh, I think, 205 pounds. Very large cat. I remember the first one I had to, uh, to track and uh, euthanize was 107 pounds. And I tell you, when he was 10 feet up a tree uh, in front of me, he looked like he was 500 pounds. He looked absolutely huge. Okay, so in, with their weight, they're also quite long. Uh, cougars are long, they're kind of skinny creatures. I apologize, I was trying to get a hide to bring in here, a cougar hide or a cougar mount so you could reference size, but I wasn't able to get it in time. Uh, another unique thing about cougars is their tail. Their ta tail is very long. Uh, the bigger the cat, the longer the tail. And a lot of times when people tell me that they've seen a cougar, I ask them to describe it to me. And if they say, well, it was brown, then it probably wasn't a cougar. But if they say, it had a long body and a really long tail, then quite possibly it was a cougar. Uh, females are quite a bit smaller, uh, 80 to 130 pounds. Uh, I know predominantly in the, in the uh, Cypress County area around Medicine Hat, a lot of the cougars we dealt with there were young females, and uh, they were all around that 60 to 75 pounds. So with cougars, they can breed any time of the year, and that's important because, uh, I mean, that's the only time they're really vocal. Okay, so P I've had people say, oh yeah, there's a cougar living behind my house in the hills because I can hear him uh, calling every night. And I ask them, well, does it sound like a little girl screaming? Yeah, that's exactly what it sounds like. Well, you know what that is? It's a fox. Okay, that's the sound the fox makes. Um, with the cougars, like I said, they're usually only vocal when they're in the, in the process of breeding. My first sighting of a cougar was actually two cougars in the Cypress Hills. I was riding my mountain bike, and I remember hearing this sound, and it, to me it sounded almost like a chainsaw running. And I thought, well, this is strange because it's the middle of nowhere. I'm on this biking trail. I stopped, and when I stopped my bike, the, the sound quit a few seconds later. And, of course, I looked right to where I heard that sound, and there was two cougars there, one on top of the other. Okay, so I'll let you guys guess what they were doing. But as soon as I stopped and looked, they looked at me. Uh, one of the cats turned and ran, and that's when I recognized it as a cougar. 
Okay, long tail, long body. My bicycling partner, he came up behind me and said, what's wrong? And I said, there's a cougar in the trees over there. And so he stopped and looked, and just as he looked, the second cougar turned and ran. Same thing, long body, long tail. Uh, they were about 75 yards off the hiking trail, and if you guys are familiar with the Cypress Hills, it's lodgepole pine, so the, the forest floor is quite open, and uh, you can see quite a ways through the lodgepole pine. And uh, so, of course, we rode back to our vehicle, and I drove to the ranger station in Elkwater and uh, told the conservation officers what I had seen. And it, just so you know, at that time, I wasn't working with Fish and Wildlife. Um, I was working for the city, and I told them about the sighting, and they pulled out a map, and they had a map where all these sightings had occurred in the park. And they said, yeah, we've had quite a few sightings up in that area. But it wasn't until about a month later, I was at the Calgary Zoo, and I heard the exact same noise coming from the cougar enclosure. I went over there, and that's when I realized that these cougars were mating, and that's the sound that they make when they're mating. So, so usually they have uh, first litter at two and a half years of age. Uh, pretty cute. Uh, unlike, I've dealt with, uh, grizz or with black bear cubs, and when they're about that size, they're like big teddy bears. They'll cuddle with you and stuff, whereas these guys will rip your face off. Okay, all there are is claws and teeth. Okay, so average litter size will be two to three with a range of one to six. And, of course, that all depends on, uh, on habitat, the health of the cat, the age of the cat. Uh, kittens are born with spots. Uh, usually up until two years, between two and three years, they'll still have bars on their front legs. That's how we can identify them as a juvenile. And they'll usually stay with mom uh, between a year to almost two years. Uh, one of the cougars that we had issues with in the Cypress Hills, uh, she was basically starving to death. It was a really uh, heavy snowfall year. There wasn't much for deer around. Uh, mom was an older cat. She had two kittens, a male and a female and she just couldn't care for them anymore. So she basically kicked them loose uh, at that one year mark. And at that one year, they're like teenagers, so that's when they get into trouble. And unfortunately, that's when we had to, to intervene and to deal with them. So cougar habitat, as you can see, the green area in the map there, uh, basically from the Yukon right down to the tip of South America. Uh, they're all part of the same genus and species. The only thing you're going to find is that uh, there's a size variance. Okay, in South America, the cougars there are a lot smaller than the ones that you'll find here in Canada. Uh, also on the coast, on the west coast, the cougars will be um, on average larger than the cougars you find here. Uh, that's starting to change a bit just because of climate change. But uh, the reason they're larger on the west coast is just milder climate. Okay, same with our grizzly bears. You'll find grizzly bears on the west coast that'll tip the scales at 1,000 pounds. Here, the biggest one I've ever dealt with was close to 600. So they, they're basically found anywhere in Alberta. We've had uh, confirmed sightings by, uh, by Sibold. Do you guys know where Sibold is? It's just west of, uh, or sorry, east of Oyen, along the Saskatchewan border. Uh, I think there was one that was in... Uh, in a barn or something, an old vacant barn that was living in. So the range has expanded. Like I said, the Cypress Hills, when I researched that area there, it wasn't until uh, 2002 when we started to get a, an increase in sightings. And I think 2004 was the first time that they had, a, I think it was a kitten that was killed along Highway 41 going through the park. So that was the first confirmed one. And then since then, it's just gone up and up. So typical habitat will include areas of uh, coniferous and deciduous mixed forest. Uh, they also uh, inhabit areas of willow and scrub brush. So in this area, drum heller along the river, right? With lots of scrub brush and stuff. The reason they like those areas is uh, they're an ambush predator. So they need areas to hide. Okay. So you're not too often going to find them on the prairie. Uh, I've found them on the prairie. Um, cougars, they're... Uh, Defense mechanism is to climb up a tree and hide in a tree. They don't hunt from trees, so that myth of them waiting in a tree for someone to walk by they, to jump on you is not true. Okay, they hide in trees to uh, get away from danger. On the prairies, they hide in culverts. Okay, we had uh, one that was in a lady's backyard. 
Uh, she walked out her back door. It ran around the front of her house, went down her driveway, and hid in her culvert. And that's where we found it was hiding in the culvert. Uh, the reason it was on the prairie at that time, I, didn't, I couldn't figure out why it was there. Uh, but then I found out from these scientists that were studying them with the tracking collars is that uh, they'll travel great distances at night. So once they disperse from mum or they're kicked out of an area by a larger tom is they will run cross country for hundreds of kilometers, hole up somewhere during the day, travel again at night until they can find another area that, uh, you know, river, uh, river bottom or river valley or something where they'll try and establish themselves. Okay. So habits in hunting, they're crepuscular, which means they're most active sunrise and sunset. And that's made, I mean, that's when you see most deer, right? They're out at sunrise. You don't see them during the day. They're out again at sunset or around sunset. Um, but they do, they do hunt any time of the day or night, depending on when they're hungry and what they're after. Uh, they're solitary animals, so you won't see packs of cougars roaming across the, the prairie. Um, unless it's mom with some kittens, okay? Or mom and dad making more kittens. So I said they're ambush predators. So uh, they typically don't stalk much. They'll sit and lie and wait. They'll find an area where there's an abundance of deer. They'll sit along a deer path and they'll wait. Um, there's been lots of recorded cases where they've stalked humans but uh, it's usually just curiosity. They want to see, you know, what's this walking, talking monkey doing in my area. So they'll follow them uh, to a certain point. And in a lot of cases, if uh, the human, you know, makes noise or they turn and, you know, start walking the other way in the path, that disrupts the stalking behavior and then they'll, they'll run off. Uh, in a lot of those cases, people don't even realize that a cougar's followed them for a kilometer or so. So... Uh, They'll get to within plus or minus 50 feet, then they'll rush their prey. It's not too often they don't catch and kill what they're after. Uh, we get complaints that, uh, you know, my horse is all scratched up on the back end. It must have been a cougar. And uh, that's not a cougar's way of hunting. They will not attack by the back end. Uh, you will not usually find scratch marks. Okay, if you look at a cougar's claws, similar to uh, those of you that have house cats, if you look at their claws, they're like hooks. And what happens when the cougar attacks is they'll jump onto their prey and those claws will come out and they'll hook into the hide and they'll basically hang on. Okay, so you won't find much scratches. Scratching there, you'll find lots of puncture wounds. Uh, they'll prey on deer, elk, moose. Uh, in the cypress hills we've seen, we've come across the odd elk or moose kill. Uh, usually large toms doing that. Uh, the most common thing that I was told by, this, by the scientists that they feed on is porcupines. So, uh, and porcupines, you see them, they're slow moving. Uh, they're usually in trees or in wooded areas, shrub brush areas uh, where the cougars are living. And uh, I've, seen, I've seen a cougar hide at the taxidermist, and the taxidermist had a pair of pliers, and he was pulling porcupine quills out of it because the guy wanted the hide tanned. So... Uh, with porcupine quills, I mean, they're not, uh, they usually don't lead to an infection or anything like that. Uh, the only time they would cause an animal problems if they got into a sinus cavity or something, but typically those quills just work their way through the body. And I've seen that with moose too, moose with a snout full of quills. Uh, a month later, they're all gone. So. so they try and knock their prey down, making a, a bite to either the neck or the throat area. So again, if I get someone in calling saying, well, my calf, the, the back end's all torn open, the tail's bitten off and stuff, not a cougar attack. They only go for the neck or the throat area. Um, they mainly feed on fresh kill, but I have seen them uh, in the Pincher Creek area where we uh, participate in an intercept feeding program. We take road kills uh, into the mountains with helicopters, drop them into piles and leave them there for the grizzly bears. And uh, there they were just trying to deter the, or defer the bears from preying on uh, calves in the spring, so they try and keep them in the mountains a little bit longer. And I've seen cougars actually laying on those piles of roadkill and feeding on them in the early spring. 
So, I mean, they are opportunistic, but they do prefer fresh, fresh meat, fresh kill. Everybody know what that is? That would be a cougar cache. So this cougar has killed something. I think, uh, can't tell by the leg there, but I think this was a young uh, horse, a foal. Uh, what they'll do is they'll drag their prey into cover and they'll cover it up with grass and leaves. Uh, bears will do much the same thing, but with bears you'll find trees and logs and rocks and stuff like that. Okay? Uh, bears will defend their kill, their kill site, or sorry, their uh, cached kill. Cougars will not. Okay. So feeding pattern, they usually, uh, they don't feed much on internal organs, uh, like the guts and stuff, like coyotes will. Um, uh, but they will tear that, the entrails out of the animal before they cache it, just so the meat doesn't rot. Some gory pictures for you. Um, so like I said, they only kill by two methods, and that's uh, they go for the back of the neck area, they try and, uh, and break the, the spine, or they, in the larger animals, they'll go for the throat area and they'll try and suffocate the animal. So we, when we investigate these, and the reason we investigate uh, livestock kills is because the province uh, provides a compensation program to producers if they're losing their, their sheep or their cattle. And uh, so we'll go out and investigate just to determine what it was that killed the animal. And uh, cougar kills are pretty, pretty distinctive. Okay? Same with bears, uh, same with coyotes or wolves. They all kill in a certain way. So public awareness prevention. Uh, this, this is where the myth and the misunderstanding come into play. Uh, cougars tend to avoid conflict with humans, and they're rarely seen. Okay, every time I give these presentations, uh, I normally, or I used to ask, how many people have seen a cougar? And almost everybody in the room would say, yep, I've seen one. I seen one yesterday, or I seen one, you know, a couple weeks ago. And uh, statistics say that 97% of cougar sightings are unfounded. Okay, it doesn't mean you didn't see a cougar. It just means that, you know, when we went out there to investigate, we didn't find tracks, we didn't find scat, we didn't find a kill, we didn't find a cougar. Okay, so nothing to substantiate that. And like I said, we've had instances where people have taken photographs or even video of a cougar and it turns out to be a house cat or a coyote or something like that. Okay? Uh, cougars are, are rare, not too many people see them in the wild. Um, depending on what area you're in, if you're on Vancouver Island then and you've encountered a cougar, I'm going to believe you because there's lots of cougars on Vancouver Island. Okay, and that's, you'll see in uh, uh, or an upcoming slide that that's where we've had most of our conflicts is on Vancouver Island. So conflicts are very rare. Uh, I mean, every year we hear about a child getting attacked by a cougar, but those always turn out to be good where mom and dad are right there and they kick the cat and the cat runs away or the cat knocks the kid down and then runs away. Okay, and a lot of that is just confusion on the cat's part. Okay, where the kid's playing close proximity to where the cougar's hunting, you get a small child like this running around and they mistake it for a deer or something like that. Uh, we've only ever had one recorded fatality in Alberta. Okay, and I have a, next, or a slide coming up that I think it was 2001 uh, that that fatality happened. Uh, here it's more bears, more bear fatalities than anything else. So human encroachment is the main cause of these increased conflicts. Uh, Cypress Hills, I, I'll keep referring to that because I, that's what I kind of studied the most. And uh, there, the, the town of Elkwater, the community of Elkwater, uh, the people there created a lot of that problem themselves because they were feeding deer. And they were attracting deer into the community in the winter time, when there's not much activity there, there's not many people that live there in the winter, uh, so they're attracting the prey species for, basically for the cougars, to make it easier for, for them to hunt. Uh, they also, one of the other problems they identified there is that a lot of the decks and sheds uh, were open underneath, which gave great hiding areas for these cougars. So what they've done since is they've, uh, they've come up with a cougar smart, similar to our bear smart program, 
where they've gone in and they've identified all these issues and uh, they made people correct them. And I think it was 20, 2015, no, 2013 was our last year. We had a lot of issues there. 2014, we had one cougar issue reported to us all winter. Whereas the year before, we had like 20 some. So, uh, I mean, that program alone eliminated a lot of the problems that we had there. Okay, so uh, some of the conflicts in urban areas. Uh, I'm sure you guys know about the cat in, in Calgary. Again, that's just human encroachment. We're, uh, I mean, we're building places, these scenic places along river valleys, along the rivers themselves. And, uh, and I mean, we have to expect some type of conflict because we're encroaching on their natural habitat. Uh, this was a young cougar um, south of seven persons that uh, was actually treed, it was up that tree at one point, uh, by this rancher's dog. And the dog uh, came across the cat in the yard, cat ran up the tree, and prior to me getting there, the rancher had already shot the cat. Uh, the thing with cougars, uh, black bears, wolves, coyotes, is uh, landowners can legally shoot any of those species any time of the year to protect their property. Okay, the only stipulation is if they shoot a cat, or sorry, a cougar or a wolf, is they have to report it to us within seven days. And the only reason is just so we can get, uh, collect biological samples. Okay. Um, it's also good for us to kind of keep tabs on what's going on. Uh, this, that year, I think we only had two landowner kills that were reported to us. Okay, so not very many. Uh, this was a young female. Um, the guy was missing, I think, chickens. He was starting to miss a few chickens in his, in his chicken coop, thought it was coyotes, and then all of a sudden the dog roasted up this cougar. So to prevent these conflicts, uh, there's lots of things that we can do as resource users and, uh, and outdoors people, and that's just to identify tracks, scat, um, you know, where we are, if we've had recent sightings, uh, you, more typically with bears, if we had a bear encounter uh, in this area and it was, or it was in kind of a centralized location or a specific location, we'd close the area down just to keep people away from the bear, uh, let the bear do what it's doing, either it's you know, looking after its young or it's feeding or something like that. Uh, that's pretty common practice in, uh, in the foothills and mountain areas. Uh, with cougars, not too often that we'll close an area because of cougars, just mainly because they travel a lot. And if, uh, uh, like the sighting that we had here a month ago, um, I'm sure that cat's probably long gone, okay, because they don't like associating with humans. And uh, in fact, that's one of the things they identified at Elkwater, is they put a paved bike path around the community to create a buffer zone to keep the cougars out of town. Because the more human activity, People walking, walking their dogs, riding their bikes, jogging, kids, you know, carrying on, making lots of noise. That buffer zone will keep the cougars from coming into town because they don't like all that human activity. So if you are in cougar country, and I don't consider Drumheller cougar country, um, but uh, I mean, if, if you're worried that there's a cat in the area, just don't walk your dog during that early morning, evening time. Um, cougars will take the odd dog, they will attack the odd dog. Uh, it's more of a, a defense, they're trying to defend their territory, uh, and they just picture a dog as a coyote or a fox. Okay, to them that's just competition. Um, I deal more with coyotes in the spring when they have their pups, uh, going after people with their dogs. And a lot of times the people get in between the coyote and their dog, and then they get bit or something like that. We can't really blame the coyote, all he say, sees is that, uh, that other uh, canine species that's coming after them, encroaching on their territory, maybe you know, creating a threat towards their young. So they're just doing what they do naturally, and that's defending their territory. Uh, this is always good too, especially if you're in the foothills or the mountains. If uh, there's a congregation of magpies, ravens, uh, scavengers, and stuff like that, um, there may be a kill in the area. And uh, more importantly, in the foothills of the mountains, it, it might be a bear kill.
Okay, and with, like I said, with the bears, they're not going to be far, and they're going to defend their kill, especially grizzlies. So a lot of this uh, stuff, if you think, if you have a house cat or you had a house cat, think of how your house cat behaves because a cougar is just a very large house cat. Okay, so if they poo in the backyard, they're going to scrape it up and cover it. Same with a cougar. Okay, so if you're walking on a trail and you see something like that, that's not going to be a kite. Okay, a kite's going to poop right in the middle of the trail and leave it there for you to step in, whereas a cougar is going to poop off the trail and cover it up. Okay? Tracks, we get lots and lots of sightings where people, we, I've seen cougar tracks. Okay? Um, if I have the time, I'm the only one that works in this area, but if I have the time, I get a cougar sighting, I'll try and get there in a timely fashion, and I'll look for tracks, scat, kill, whatever. Um, with the tracks, I'd say 95% of the time, they're dog tracks. Okay? Uh, we can't just go by the claws. Okay? I look at uh, the size of the track itself and the shape of it. A cougar track will be in a round shape, especially in the snow. If you're looking at a track that's almost perfectly round, it's going to be a, a, a cougar track, okay? And large, three and a half inches. Okay, dogs will be more of an oval shape. Oops. So they'll be more, more of an oval shape. You look at the toes, even their toes are more of a kind of a teardrop shape to them, whereas cougars, uh, they have more of a round, round toe. Um, people talk about drawing an X through them. You can draw an X through a dog track kind of between those top two toes and the bottom pad without touching any of the, the toes. Whereas a cougar, you can't do it. You end up with kind of two Ys attached to each other. Okay? Uh, the other telltale thing is the, the bottom lobe. You can see there's three um, little uh, lobes on there, whereas a dog's only got two. Okay? Uh, with the, the tail or toenail prints, um, some people trim those right back in their dogs, so you're not, you might not see that. Uh, with a cougar, you get an older cat, their tendons start to wear out. When they step down, their claws will actually come out, and you will see claw marks in there. Uh, if a cougar's walking on ice or in mud or some type of slippery service, surface, they will uh, extract their claws for better grip. Okay, so you can't always go by the, by the claw marks. Uh, just another picture of a cougar kill, cached. That's on an elk. It's an elk. Uh, those that are producers have livestock. Um, I know a few years ago I was getting a lot of concern over, again, the Cypress Hills area during calving season. And I investigated some, uh, some dead calves. Um, and I think one of them was, was a or a coyote kill. The other ones were, were all fed on by coyotes post-mortem. So the, the calf died of something else and then it was fed on afterwards. And uh, usually when we investigate those, I can, just by turning the hide inside out, I can tell a lot of stuff from that. Uh, when it was, if it was uh, killed by a predator or if it was just fed on afterwards. Um, and in a lot of cases, what type of predator it is. And that's just by measuring canine puncture marks. Um, but with these calf kills, uh, I started to question, well, we ever had a calf in the spring killed by a cougar? And I actually sent a province-wide email out to all our officers, and uh, I got two replies back saying they had uh, possibles, but they weren't confirmed. Okay, so not very common for cougars to attack um, cattle, calves. Um, more so sheep. When I worked in Pincher Creek, I shook my head why people would raise sheep out there um, because of the cougars and the, the bears and the wolves and stuff. And then I came across a guy that was raising llamas. And I thought, well, okay, here's... Cougars must just drool all over themselves when they see a llama because their neck is this long. And I mean, that's what they go after, right? So, but uh, minimize the risk. Um, the predator fencing, you see a lot of guys that raise sheep have that predator fence, it's a page wire fence, they put that around their whole entire pasture and that eliminates 90% of the problem there and that's usually with coyotes.
Okay. Removing vegetation. I had another lady had a cougar in her yard, uh, acreage south of Medicine Hat. When I went there, uh, lots of rabbits, lots of, uh, I think she even had a few porcupines left still, but uh, she had trees that had grown right to the ground with grass that was this tall and it was all intermixed. So lots of good hiding spots for a cougar. Whereas if you trim all that off and keep the grass cut down, cougars don't have a hiding spot. They're not going to like that. They're not going to be hanging out there. So if you're traveling in cougar country, which is usually bear country, it's always good to travel as a group. Uh, carry a walking stick and pepper spray, um, or bear spray. Bear spray works on a multitude of animals, everything from, uh, from stray dogs to cougars to bears to rogue moose, elk, whatever. Okay, pepper spray works really good. Um, if you do carry pepper spray, I, I recommend you take a a course. We do teach a course for bear spray. Uh, you can find some stuff online. The other thing with bear spray is people typically carry it in the bottom of their backpack. And how useful is that when a bear is charging at you? Not very. Um, the other thing with bear spray too is it's usually only good for five years and then there's an expiry date on there. Um, with mine I always replace it uh, just prior to that expiry because I'm not going to trust my life to something that's expired. It may work, it may not. And that's kind of a no-brainer, right? But in saying that, though, I've seen people in Jasper walk up to gigantic bull elk that are bedded down and reach out to grab an antler while their friend takes a picture. Uh, with kids, keep them close at hand. Uh, especially if you're camping in a wooded area, you don't want them running off by themselves, especially the wee little ones, the three, four, and five-year-olds. Uh, if you do see a cougar in the area, the first thing you do is pick up those kids. Uh, have set boundaries for them, and just common sense, right? Kind of like the pet thing. You don't let them out at dusk and dawn to play. And education is, is always a good thing, okay? I left some pamphlets here. You guys can help yourselves afterwards. With uh, the Cypress Hills, uh, a lot of the schools in Medicine Hat would take their kids out camping uh, in the Cypress Hills at one of the, the Bible camps or whatever. And uh, for a while, there was a real drop-off in the amount of uh, schools that were taking kids out there because of this fear over uh, cougars. Uh, that's when... I offered up this course or this talk to the schools and it was almost mandatory every spring I would do half a dozen of these to the schools that were taking groups out to the Cypress Hills. Exact same presentation you guys are getting. So if you encounter a cougar, a lot of this stuff, uh, forget about what you learnt with bears. Okay, Bears and cougars are like bears and cougars, apples and oranges. Okay. Um, I think some people get confused with, with uh, cougars being like bears. If they, uh, their garbage is tipped over or they see something's been eating in their compost, they know there's no bears around, but they're going to blame uh, the next best thing, which is the cougars. Well, cougars don't typically go through garbage. They don't eat compost. Um, so they're, in those aspects, they're, they're opposite of bears. Same with encounters. Okay? With bears, we're told what? Don't run, play dead. Right? Uh, with cougars, we never play dead, okay? So we're going to try and look as big and mean as we can. Uh, there w the myth about eye contact, you want to maintain eye contact with the cat just to try and unnerve them, okay? If it's agitated, though, we're going to use our peripheral vision and we're going to talk to the cougar. Don't eat me. Please don't eat me, okay? <laughs> the reason we talk to them is, in some cases... We're, especially when we're by ourselves, we're not making any noise, we're just walking through the bush. And uh, the cougar may not know what we are. Okay, maybe the wind's, the wind's blowing in our, in our face. When we're looking at the cat, the cat can't smell us. It's confused, doesn't know what we are. As soon as we start talking, it hears that strange human voice, and then right away it's, it's gone. 
So make your cell face as large as possible. So if you have a walking stick, you hold it above your head, your jacket, wave your arms, and you're just you're sending a message to that cougar that you don't he doesn't want to mess with you. I say walking stick. Whenever I'm in the backcountry, I always carry a walking stick even when I'm working. Um, if the cougar starts approaching you, just throw it off. Throw, start throwing rocks, sticks, stuff like that. So if you are attacked, again, with bears, like I said, you don't want to portray any type of aggression towards a bear because that's just going to provoke him to attack. Um, with a cougar, if for whatever reason they jump on you, you're going to fight back. Okay? And what I tell the kids is you're going to stick your finger in its eyes, its ears, whatever. You're going to kick and scream and everything else. Because unlike us, cougar's a wild animal. If he gets hurt in a fight, he can't call 911. The ambulance picks him up, takes him to the hospital, fixes him up, right? I mean, that's life and death for him. If he gets hurt, there's a very good chance that he's probably going to die. So they're not going to pick a fight that they're going to lose or may lose. Um, again, with, with the, just the way they attack, they're going to go for head and neck areas, so make sure you cover those areas up. And like I said, poke your fingers and its eyes, its ears, whatever. It sounds kind of nasty. Um, I mean, very rarely does this happen. But I mean, if it ever did, I mean, knowing what to do is, is paramount, right? So some examples of non-aggressive behavior, uh, viewing from a distance, uh, they either run away or they're trying to hide. Um, that or a lack, there's a lack of attention, so maybe they haven't even seen you. They're just walking across a hillside and they don't even notice you're there. Uh, probably in those cases, not. you probably don't want to yell, hey cougar, look at me, right? Maybe just turn, walk slowly out of the area, keeping an eye on where the cougar's gone. So moderate or threatening behavior. Again, think of your house cat when you throw that ball or you're holding their ball. What are they doing? They're staring at it. Right? They may make a hissing sound or a, a deep grumbling sound. Um, so, I mean, those, that type of behavior could be uh, a warning that, you know, maybe the cougar's going to attack. So this is, uh, if you've got your bear spray, you're going to have it out and the safety off, ready to go. Um, with bear spray, I mean, you don't have to spray uh, the animal when it's on top of you or close to being on top of you, okay? That's why I suggest you take a course or you learn how to use your bear spray because most, uh, most canisters of bear spray will spray 30 feet, okay? They come out in a mist, they'll spray 30 feet. Keep in mind where the wind is, though. Right, because if the wind's in your face, the bear spray is going to be in your face. Okay, so you may have to turn, but if you can get that that uh, spray to travel with the wind in the direction of the cougar or the bear or whatever, I mean, he's going to get a whiff of that long before he gets close to you, and that's probably going to deter him from coming any closer. So always think of uh, escape avenues. Uh, beware your surroundings. Uh, when I'm in the mountains, I always carry a whistle. And if I get into an area where it's really thick underbrush and stuff, I know there's bears up there, uh, I'll usually give a, give a couple of blasts in that whistle every 20, 30 feet. And again, an unnatural sound, it's going to let the critters know that there's a human there. Most, most of our bear attacks uh, in the province happen in the fall time, and they happen to hunters. Okay, and when you think about this, you get a hunter, especially a bow hunter, he's dressed in camouflage, he sprays himself with deer urine or something like that to mask his human scent, and then he makes animal sounds. Right? So you got a bear that hears the animal sounds, comes up on this lump of something that smells like deer pee, while he's thinking is food. Right? So, I mean, that really confuses the bear, whereas me, well, not so much my green outfit, but I mean, you guys dressed as you are, wearing what you are for deodorant or you know, perfume or whatever, I mean, that, that's all unnatural to the bear, right? He's going to realize that you're not a prey species. Okay. So aggressive behavior. So remember, they're ambush predators. What I tell my kids, if you're walking in an area where it's real thick underbrush, 
Um, for every 10 steps you take forward, just turn around and take a couple back. Because if there's something stalking you, as soon as you turn around and start moving in its direction, that's going to throw it off, and they're typically just going to leave, okay, because you're on to them. Again, think of your house cat. If you've got a cougar over there, and he's crouched down, and his tail is twitching back and forth, and he's staring at me, and he's starting to pump his legs, uh, there's a good chance that he's coming to get me, okay, for whatever reason. Uh, this picture here was a, there was a cougar that we caught right in Pincher Creek. Uh, we suspected it was living there for probably a month. Um, and then someone's dog scared it out of its hiding spot, which I think was under a deck in a backyard. Uh, we chased the cougar for several blocks, just kind of jumping over fences, going through yards. It finally went into a storm drain. And uh, my partner went into the storm drain with... Uh, uh, a banger shell and his earmuffs and he shot this banger shell off um, while he was climbing in there we had set up this trap this bear trap with the door open and we managed to scare the cat out and right into the trap close the door and uh, as you can see in there the cat wasn't very happy in fact uh, a few seconds after I took that picture it came right at the end of the the trap and uh, all I could see was its claws coming through the trap like this it was mad Okay, so precursor to an attack. So just some stats. Um, like I said, this slide has been around, or this PowerPoint's been around for a few years. I'm just going to cruise through them here quick. But you'll notice that British Columbia comes up quite a bit. Uh, British Columbia and California. There's Alberta, 2001. Uh, this was... Uh, 30-year-old female cross-country skier that was in Banff, and I believe she was by herself. Uh, the cat that attacked her was an older female cat. Um, she was, uh, the cat was basically starving to death. There wasn't much for prey around, and the cat was getting pretty desperate what it was going to eat. And all of a sudden, the skier comes along, and that happened to be what, what it went after. Okay, that is the only fatality that uh, we've ever had in Alberta. Okay, unless it happened during the Lewis and Clark expedition and wasn't recorded. But. So I said BC, California, if you live in one of those two areas, then your chances of running into a cougar are a little bit greater. In uh, here, if we have cougar issues, we usually call a houndsman to come help us. We have uh, predator response teams that come and help us out with that stuff. Um, but it's, a lot of it's contracted out in BC because they deal with them so much, they actually have officers with trained dogs, and that's all they do is chase cats and, and bears. Just to break down some fancy charts here. So most victims are that five to nine years, so the, the little ones like this, and just confusion on the cougar's part. And in a lot of cases, the, the cats are in, in good condition, but there are a few that are underweight, um, have some type of issues. So some stats for you here. I thought this was interesting that uh, um, there's more people killed by lightning than there is by bee stings or dog bites. Uh, rattlesnakes, black widows, uh, just something about rattlesnakes and black widows. Um, no fatalities in Canada from rattlesnakes or black widows. The reason being is we're at the very northern end of their range, so their venom toxicity is very minimal. So if you get, ever get bitten by a rattlesnake or a black widow, it's similar to getting bit by a bee or a wasp. Unless you have some underlying health conditions, uh, you're deathly allergic to bees or something, then you might be in trouble if you get bitten by a rattlesnake or a, or a black widow. So uh, some Drumheller stats. I got on my computer, we have a reporting system where we, we enter all our uh, occurrences in. 
Um, or I should say most of our occurrences go in there. Uh, so I went, I could only go back as far as 1999. I found 81 reported sightings uh, in the Drumheller area that were reported to our office here in Drumheller. Uh, out of those 81 reported sightings, one uh, set of confirmed cougar tracks were found. Uh, there were four probable sightings via description. And like I said, when somebody says to me that it had a really long body and a long tail and a small head, then my, my bet would be it probably was a cougar they seen. If they say, well, it looked like a cougar. Okay, well, tell me what it looked like. Well, it looked like a cougar. Okay, well, tell me what it looked like. Um, and other stuff, too. It was brown, right? Or it had a really bushy tail. Well, it's going to be a coyote if it's got a bushy tail. Um, four of those sightings were determined to be domestic dogs. Okay, so your, uh, your uh, golden labs, your golden retrievers, stuff like that. Five were determined to be house cats. Okay, and there was even two that were video documented. And the officer that was here at the time looked at the videos and said, yeah, that's a house cat. And apparently one person argued that, no, it's not even though it was, had a white tip on its tail. Most cougars have a black tip on, it, on their tail, and it was this big, walking around underneath cars and stuff. Nope, was, that's a cougar. Uh, six were determined to be coyotes. Uh, there were three livestock injuries that were initially reported as possibly by a cougar, and they were all proven to be either coyotes or dogs, some type of canine species. Uh, in 2002, uh, it was quite interesting, there was a whole flurry of activity that I found uh, that occurred in 2002 between Rosedale, Cambria area, of course right along the river. Uh, and Fish and Wildlife st stepped it up because the public was asking, you know, we need something done because we have all these sightings and stuff. So Fish and Wildlife set up numerous trail cameras. Uh, they set traps. Uh, they even brought in some houndsmen to try and track these cougars. And uh, they never did trap a cougar, never did find a cougar, never even got a picture of a cougar on a trail camera. Okay? Now, was there a cougar there? Possibly. Um, but there's a good chance it was just moving through the area, or all of a sudden they increased human activity and it was gone. Okay? Trolling for mountain lions. <laughs> 